maybe I shouldn't be puffing on that while you got the camera rolling. Here's the deal. Everything I've done, it seems like almost like the easy way out or the cheap way out or pen and ink. All right, just ink, you know, pen and ink. I mean, that's, that's just basic. That's like black ink. You know, on white papers. Let them get, you know, what's what's lower than this? I was sticking dirt, right? right? So this is the this is like the cheapest way. That's what we did. We were in Alton. Hey. So we just did pen on ink and just draw. The first thing that struck me with fear was that I was gonna have to be drawing these things with pen and ink. I said, can I use a pencil? I said, well, that'll be extra expensive because they'll have to shoot a half ton. And I said, well, look, Jim Franklin gets to do drawing ones sometimes. Said, well, when you're Jim Franklin, you can do that too. You know? Someone says, how do you know when you're finished with a painting? Because I'm released from it. It's kind of like someone let go of the string and the balloon is now on its own. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, what do we got? And he said, we've got the Grateful Dead with a rodeo. <laughs> We're gonna do a Grateful Dead rodeo. And I was, well, hell yeah. <laughs> of course we are. <laughs> now, if you came from other communities in, in Texas, I mean, uh, and especially if, if your hair was long and your proclivities were countercultural, you know, it, uh, it was a wonderful place to be. Posters are in their own category and have their own special lure in place in our minds, you know, that they do stuff other paintings simply can't. And, you know, this concert long gone, you know, out there floating in the universe. The poster is still up on their wall and they might see it every day. Even being a Texas city, it wasn't a hillbilly city. Austin is still 200,000 people. And according to Doug Sobb's estimate, 100,000 of them were groovers. There was UT, and there was state government. And that was about it. Those were the industries in town. Austin was still comparatively smaller population-wise to Houston or Dallas, but it had much more happening, and it was like, all of a sudden, the bigger cities weren't the happening places. And there was a style that was unique and separate. Why didn't it happen in Houston? Why didn't it happen in San Antonio? It all comes back to psychedelics. Because Austin, you know, had its own psychedelic scene as small as it was, but it was based around peyote and mescaline, and that was never the case in Houston or Dallas. I had a sense that I could develop a whole new painting technique or approach. This may open a window to a possibility. And we got some peyote and started chopping it up. We smashed the peyotes and cooked it down into the mother liquid in this big, in this big tub. Local sheriff's deputy came driving up to the house one day. Deputy sheriff said, "What are you? What's going on here? What are you boys doing here?" Jim Franklin was one of the choppers, and Jim he said, "Why well, we're students from the University of Texas and we're doing an art project and we're extracting dye." for our art project from this plant. And <laughs> there were the, the corpses of 40,000 peyote buttons all over the yard, all through the house. 
deputy scratches his head and says, okay, and drove off. I wound up with about a kilo of mescaline from that. That was how the Vulcan got started. I'd arrived on the island, didn't have to go any further. All of us, I think, riffed off of uh, Jim Franklin. There was this character, Rocky Erickson, that was part of the background. And it turns out these guys were you know, promoting shows. Never quite sure. Never quite sure that this is it. Rocky, how you been? Just fine. John Ike, good to see you. And uh, from their psychedelic album, we have chosen something I don't think they've done on our show before. It's called Don't Fall Down, The 13th Floor Elevators. So we started doing shows with them under the structure of the electric grandmother. Well, the elevators, they played the Vulcan twice. And when they all took acid together and were on the same track, they were great. It wasn't like they set out to become professional concert promoters. It's just like they had a passion for the music. The night's take would be $12 for the band. Sandy gets $1.50 for fronting us money on fixing Charlie's amp. The IL Club on East 11th. We played there, heaven knows, it was probably a Tuesday night or something, and our pay was a barbecue sandwich. And we were so happy to have that gig. What we're talking about is over half a century ago. And that was the first branch from the west side, if you will, to the east side, the commercial center of Black Austin. First time people were comfortable going into that area. You know, I used to go there and get my hair cut, you know, because I couldn't get it cut on the drag. Really? Oh, hell no. Couldn't even go in the barbershop. All the lunch counters, the Piccadilly uh, cafeteria, everybody. Everything. Yeah. And yeah, it was zipped up tight. <laughs> you know, we couldn't afford TV time, and we couldn't really afford radio time. You know, I remember living on somebody's back porch yes. on San Jacinto, you yes. know, what, for a week? Yeah. For a weekend? So handbills and posters were the only outlet for it. That was the only way you could advertise a band. Images in their DNA, they knew how to tap into stuff that already was in the mind of the person who saw it. I was trying to find an, an image out of the names of the groups on the list for a handbill for a, a concert in the park. And then I thought, well, I'll find something that would represent the audience. I'd just come across a zoology handbook, Mammals of North America, and there was a painted illustration of an armadillo. And I thought, oh, armadillo would be a perfect symbol for the audience. Hipsters were, beatniks were like armadillos. We're peaceful and we, we mind our own business and we're always getting run over by rednecks. <laughs> And so I have an armadillo. He's just come across a matchbox of marijuana, and some joints are rolled up, and there's the armadillo puffing one of the rolled joints. Instantly, it connected with the audience. That became overnight symbol of Texas hippies.
four of you were there just blue bonnet painting. That's all there was. Then you showed up. <laughs> suddenly, woo! <laughs> Armadillo. No, it's a whole new thing. The kids go nuts after they're having live music. It's the live music capital of the world. The Rag had put out a special double issue that was a Jim Franklin drawing of a giant crack in the ground with billions of armadillos rising up out of it and a little bitty stage way back in the distance, perfectly branded with the armadillo because the armadillos are nocturnal creatures. They spend most of their time snuffling around with their head close to the ground looking for something to eat. And I've been a colorblind artist all my life. And I looked at that and went, man, I can do that. Filled my Volkswagen bus to the top. We even packed the dirty dishes. We just swooped in. It seemed like there was sort of a school that we developed among ourselves in the 70s. Somebody had asked me once why our posters have portraits on them. But no, almost nowhere else in the country did they do that. Well, to begin with, Franklin had done his blues legend, Mance Lipscomb. And I flipped it over and did Charlie Pritchard of the Conqueroo, two concerts out of one poster. <laughs> it just jumped out, and we were all way into the idea of a poster as a window. So it looked like there was depth there that you could put your hand in. A good rock poster will do two things. It will make the uninitiated want to go see the event that this graphic represents. Like, so something in the graphic has to convey a message, what you think you're going to experience, and that has to be attractive. I took one look at this flyer, Michael Murphy and Willie Nelson. These two cowboys kind of back slapping each other and just shuffling along. On the second level, there has to be something in the poster to make that initiated person feel included in the experience beforehand so they're in the know. It was my invitation to Austin. It was just as if it had been engraved and said, Margaret, come on down, we're waiting for you. The appeal of this was you could be part of the experience. If you were a great artist, you were part of the process. And San Francisco validated all that. They created the whole hierarchy in the rock culture. The San Francisco artists were all crazy on drugs. Really, this is where it started. Owsley was the first guy to synthesize LSD, 1964, over in Berkeley. They figure he produced somewhere between the first million and the first three million hits of LSD. This is where it began to mushroom out. I had made a trip up there and back when I was 16 on the power of thumb, and I got dosed with a brand new batch of STP. Keeps you psychedelic for about three days and three nights. And I memorized all the posters. There was some kind of connection between Texas and San Francisco. Chet Helms well, always called it the hippie highway, you know, had Madison, Wisconsin, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Austin, Texas, San Francisco brisk trade in peyote coming from Texas and LSD going to Texas. San Francisco made big batches, and that was a wonderful thing. So everybody was on the same wavelength. Exactly. exactly. How much of uh, those psychedelics do you think entered into what became your work? 
Maybe it opened up any limitations on my thinking, erased inhibitions I may have had. The surrealism, you know, uh, they were all trying to break through. What could be you know, what I learned with LSD was the reason I stopped taking it and trying to do art was because I couldn't tell where the surface of the paper was. I could see three miles into it, but where in the hell is my pen? It was a key to some areas of thinking, but it wasn't any kind of room that I wanted to live in, you know. It's like, here's the door opens, but you don't sleep on the door sill. like dream communication. It's almost kind of like remembering something out of your dream, but you're, you're just seeing things from a different perspective. When you're working on something, you're just kind of locked into this thing. Sometimes, and then turn around and look at it for a minute, and you'll see it all feels and looks different. And sometimes you can learn, you know, some sort of an archetypal message. Austin type owes a lot to San Francisco. You see that early on with the Vulcan offerings. The cream of the crop of Vulcan posters, what got the Austin poster scene started. I was the house artist and they just left it up to me. This logo is not derivative of anything, it's just goofy Gilbert scat. And I love this logo. There was an Austin printer named Johnny Mercer that was willing to do experimental type printing, and we did some really nice posters. The day did tobacco bubbles in December, which we've been open for about two months. Everybody agrees that that's one of the best posters that anybody ever did in that genre, period. And it's totally original. No end, give your love to me. Probably the crown jewel of the big Vulcan posters. Gilbert totally came into his own as far as I'm concerned at that point. One of the, the main techniques of graphic design is to focus the viewer's eye to create diagonals and, and light and centering and so forth so that a viewer knows where to look. These posters from the 60s the opposite is at work. And, you know, and creating something that, in a way, was hard to look at. It was about creating an optical experience. And that was really exciting and really different and broke with all the truisms of good design. When we opened the Vulcan, I was like stoned on acid all the time and was enthusiastic and wanted to do all this stuff. And Houston was just, you know, like, oh, brother. Uh, did anybody at the time know that these posters were some great works of art? No, they did. were just a way to advertise because for a goodly long time. September 25th, we got some advertising. September 25th? They would not accept our money, so we had to put out these. Consider the Vulcan's first house artist who did leave like most other good hippies did that had aspirations in Texas that went to San Francisco. You know, we saw the evacuees. They were coming out to San Francisco like there was a fire in Texas. There was tons of work. There was a real appreciative audience. There was generous available amounts of LSD. And the cops weren't on your ass. And Gilbert Shelton left basically to stake out his own career as an underground comics artist or a Jackson who both did posters, but it was their cartooning style that pretty much drove what they did. I mean, how
how cool is that? That the guy that did the first underground comic. Written by Jack Jackson, printed in the basement of the Capitol. Jack Jackson is, is generally acknowledged by that a guy that worked as an accountant for the state of Texas for his day job so he could reform at night and in his other lives. The scene just shifted from posters to comics, just boom, without any trouble. And Gilbert Shelton, although he intended to go to San Francisco and do poster art, the success of underground comics, he became famous as the creator of Wonder Warthog and the fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. When I was in high school, I remember going, like in Stephenville, looking at Hot Rod magazine and looking in the back for Wonder Warthog. And it's like, holy shit, what is this? I'd never seen anything like that before. Seldom have you been in a supermarket without brushing by the news rackets, where with word and picture, lust and violence filled pages devoured by juvenile eyes. It would seem that publishers of this material deliberately print these magazines, in the parlance of the narcotic, to hook the adolescent into the knowledge of the unnatural. These publishers know well that once so exposed, the insatiable curiosity of youth will cause him to delve deeper and deeper into this grotesque material until his utter depravity is complete. Oh, I see, yeah. World War II used the comic book very, very effectively for our soldiers in instruction manuals. One of the greatest cartoonists that ever lived, Will Eisner, was hired by the services during that time to, in fact, illustrate comic books about everything from how to take apart a gun to how to repair a Jeep. And this went very well with people because they thought, for some reason, this was a perfect thing for people to read because they were not well educated, therefore a comic book would be good. So people came back from World War II really liking their comics. So all of this combined to release a more desire for more information, and how that information was prepared and packaged greatly was in the form of a comic book. And later in the psychedelic era, the poster. There was a very vibrant psychedelic scene in Detroit with the Grandy Ballroom. And an artist up there, Gary Grimshaw, who turned out a lot of good work. There was a big migration factor of people coming back and forth constantly. The transplant, in a sense, worked out better in Austin than it did in Denver. Denver just wasn't, wasn't ready at all. I'm not really familiar with a lot of poster work coming out of New York. New York was a very hard-edged scene and involved with the takeover at Columbia University. Oh, and then the police came and busted all the students, etc. Oh, that was the first gay liberation thing, and it was so controversial. Yeah. I took it to the printers, and they couldn't figure out which one was the girl. They couldn't conceive that there were to be two men. How much are you student. selling this one for? <laughs> we're not selling it. You're not selling it? Who do I have to kill for it? I would buy stuff from the artists, right? And all my friends thought I was stupid. Why are you doing that? You can buy stock, you can buy General Motors. Of everything I've ever bought in my life, posters, these things turned out the best investment I've ever made. You had to buy interesting good stuff, but sometimes just follow your heart. Danny Gary, on the Dancing Buddy poster, you about 500 to go, and at 500 where? I'm at 300, now four, I'm at 300 here, now four, 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 and lightweight imitation of the San Francisco art, you could definitely tell those people were not using LSD.
You need to understand and appreciate that San Franciscans are so provincial. This is the end destination of 5,000 years of the Western progress of Western civilization. People that, that have come to appreciate San Francisco culture in the 1960s do not realize it was Austin people that helped create the San Francisco postering scene. Chet Helms preceded Bill Graham through the family dog. Helms' elders were preachers that used those big, hard cardboard posters as the means to announce their revivals. And it just so happened that Jim Franklin came back to, to Austin since he'd been paid for the early run and came back broke and, and just without asking, moved into the upper floor of the ballroom. In exchange for doing this art, I had to have free rent, you know, and a great big studio too. It was like, we were creating our own thing. I never had to bring my, my drawing to anyone for approval. I took it directly to the printer. I had a letter from Bergstrom Air Force Base that everybody at Bergstrom and everybody at Fort Hood that my club was off limits. We developed really sharp elbows because the environment was so un unwelcoming and so unaccommodating. So if I knew you, you were okay. If I didn't know you, fuck you. You know, I mean, that was the dynamic. I live When the Conqueror went to San Francisco, the Vulcan Gas Company, during that period, had some of its biggest acts. One of the problems I have with the authorities there was is that I booked black and white bands on the same bill, and they didn't like that. I booked all the Chicago stuff. I booked Muddy Waters. I booked John Lee Hooker. I booked Big Joe Williams. I booked Jimmy Reed. I mean, that was a huge impact on Austin to get away from the top 20 clubs and do something adventurous. Vulcan offerings almost mirrored what was going on in San Francisco, especially the lettering. These almost seem to be anti-lettering. High contrast, I want to prominent. Dance, it was a kind of an imitation of what they were doing at the, at the Avalon and, and, and San Francisco. You had to work at it. You had to, you had to engage. You had to be in a dance with lettering to understand it. That theme was continuing for a solid two years before she was headband wanted to open their own club. I kind of conceived it and I founded the place with uh, money we had from a Capitol record contract about 10 years ago. I guess my band, she was headband, wanted a place to play. And there really wasn't anything. The old Vulcan Gas Company, which I guess is Bruce Call's counterculture uh, happening, was uh, over. We'd been really scrupulous, and all the musicians had been great. And they'd come through, and they'd do sweeps through the whole building. And you go through the cases and everything. They never found a seed or a stem, nothing. And Jerry said, if, they, if I didn't quit putting energy into the club, that they'd plant a half a pound on me. I'd do 15 to 25 and on and I said, well, thanks for the tip. That's when, I, that's, that's when I quit. At Bud Schrake's behest, I did not call it Armadale National Headquarters. I knew I was on the, the trail of the name and sitting at 3rd and Congress, looking at the old Vulcan Gas Company, decided Armadillo World Headquarters uh, ought to be the name. By that time, I was in college and had a new wife and a baby on the way. I didn't have much time to think about it until they got Captain Beefheart booked in here. I've been a Captain Beefheart freak 
most of my young life and, and was amazed that there was enough other weirdos in all of Texas that cared enough about Captain Beefheart to have him come here. Through the course of the next couple of years, moved back to Fort Worth, that wasn't much fun. Came back down here on an offer to become the art director of an ad agency when I was 20 years old. And I said, well, that sounds pretty good. Who do we got for accounts? And they said, Armadillo and Oak Willis. And I just went, OK, I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> Instead of the Vulcan being the end of the scene, it was like here's phase two is opening in a bigger format. We were right behind the psychedelic guys. Austin's scene from 67 to 70 was what people think of as the 60s. From 70 to 74, it was Austin exploding as an armadillo inspired period. The coming together of country and western and amplified rock. That brought two diverse, almost op oppositional demographics together, the hippie and the cowboy. And I always wanted to see something like this happen in Austin. I never conceived anything that this, this elaborate would ever come of it. I was coordinating some other artists that wanted to do posters. It was evidence that there was a scene in Austin, and there was a club here that you could perform your live music, your original music at. Austin posters had their own distinct style. They just really did. So I, I was just like putting them together, you know, I was studying Ken Featherston posters. Jim Franklin posters and Michael Priest posters and going, hey, when do you stop drawing the lines and start drawing the dots? You know, all of these little questions that came up. There was no more what they'd been doing to Jim, figuring that we give him a place to stay upstairs, we don't have to pay him for any art. I think sometime they did, but that was a reason that they often used not to. And people like Carrie Fitzgerald, later changed his name to Carry On, from Houston. I was felt like, you know, Jim himself said he didn't ever like to do like commercial stuff, but I was always like, I will do any job. I don't have no morals or I will draw an ad for your restaurant, you know, or whatever, and I'll do the lettering or whatever. It takes. Yeah. Guy Juke, who was uh, actually D. White uh, from Lubbock. I'd gotten an F in art. I said, you flunked art at Texas Tech. Like, wow, now there's some credentials. I come from a, a life of just, you know, everybody hating me, you know, in high school because I wasn't a good football player or something. You know, I had my little group of weirdo friends and all that. Coming to Austin was like, oh, well, for one thing, they don't know I'm a bad football player. They don't give a damn. It's like starting over. And these posters were being carried to Houston and Dallas and wherever. Bill Narum from Houston. Well, I met Bill Narum down at Space City News, you know, 1969 probably. Bill Narum was one of the most consistent and reinventive of all the post artists. He came with his own rep as kind of the go-to artist for ZZ Top when ZZ Top blew up in Houston. Bill was a real deal, and uh, not everyone who is established as a poster artist in Austin was the complete artist, knowing how not only to do art, but to take care of your business. It's like a different breed once again. He was like a guy that was just, uh, he was an artist, you know? Mm. The city had not changed physically that much. In other words, the development phase hadn't kicked in. It's like, you know, like a real homecoming. So they came to Austin to check it out. I remember Danny Garrett had just gotten out of the out of the military and he, he wanted to do a comic book. For me personally, uh, I had a lot of adjustments to make. Fresh to Austin, 
There were a lot of things going on in my head at the time, trying to adjust and readjust to my new circumstances. And they all come from different directions. That's an interesting thing. You know, Danny was a history major. He was like completely self-taught, which is absolutely amazing because he does amazing stuff. Problem was, I got radicalized by the war. People used to ask me, I said, what was your lottery number? And I said, my lottery number was 1968. A year of Tet and all that, they were taking pretty much everybody they could nab. Because I had a degree, I could have gone to OCS, Officer Candidate School, but I chose not to. I didn't want to be leading men as a, an inexperienced soldier. I didn't want to do it. We were out there patrolling, trying to get a response, that is to draw fire. And of course, Americans with superior firepower, what we would do is we would draw fire and then we would try to encircle the area that we got the fire from and then drop ordnance on that area until nothing moved and went in to see the results of that. <laughs> well, yeah, it's pretty rough. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's as bad as you, you think it is. The work I initially did was political. I did covers and editorial cartoons for Space City News down in Houston. And my brother started working on the rag, and then he started Space City in Houston. And I was just draw little stuff for them, you know? I remember I drawing my first rag cover when I was like 15. And did uh, some artwork for the Texas Observer. Austin was kind of more peaceful, laid back. I moved here in January 1970, so, you know, it was a Nixon era and all that's going on and stuff, and Vietnam War and everything that happened. Houston was just in the thick of it. So, I wanted to get away from all that stuff, tell you the truth. And people that came to town came to Armadillo because it was the most happening place in the fucking world for a while there. You guys were producing these posters. You were deliberately creating icons to pass out to the congregation. Yes. My fun on all this was I tried to create the aura or image that I was becoming a high priest. That I was creating a cult, the armadillo cult. And for me, it was a way of slamming cults. That would have these fake ritual things on stage. I was a master of ceremonies. I took that literally. I had to have a ceremony to master. The very first Armadillo poster. I had Willie Nelson come in. The priest was the only person that I ever made any kind of suggestions to. I asked him for a poster that would have a cowboy crying into a mug of beer with a jukebox behind him pumping hello walls and a little portrait of Willie in the corner. And he came back the next day with that poster exactly like I had described it, much better than I could have ever, you know, imagined it. I remember meeting Priest, he came in from Dallas. Suddenly he was like this hot shot guy and this young guy that suddenly appeared out of nowhere. And he did that Willie Nelson poster, this kind of weird Walt Disney cartoon style that just blew me away. It's like, wow, I, he's just another one of these guys that just came fully developed. The very first show I worked was Willie Nelson's first show in front of long-haired weirdos. And we didn't know, we were sweating that one pretty serious. We didn't know if that was going to go at all. And nobody really quite yet knew who Willie Nelson was, although a lot of people recognized his, his tunes once they heard him. We really didn't know who the guy was. He'd been mostly known as a writer. And that worked so well on those 600 people the first night that we did it again the next night. And that one packed it. From then on, it just started rolling. He said, hey, I got this friend in Nashville. Might like playing down here. I don't know if y'all ever heard of a guy named Waylon Jennings. He said, that came rolling around long about 73. 
Once that hit, well, pretty much here it went in every direction. Explosive. We had a concert hall that would hold almost 2,000 people. We opened at noon, we closed at two in the morning. And we had a beer garden that would hold another six or 700. The armadillo allowed us to come in here, be obnoxious, play the kind of music we do. Cowboys like it, straight people like it. I never had it. In a regular club, you couldn't do this. This isn't just a concert hall. This isn't just one of the best concert halls with one of the best sounds and all kinds of fabulous murals on the wall. It's also like a community arts center, really. So in the two and a half years we were in San Francisco, a lot had changed. A lot of the crowd had moved on. A lot of the college kids were, were different. By 71, it was okay. It had changed. And a, a cowboy hat. Culturally approved stamped outlaws. We were a cultural phenomenon. You know, it was a place to, to kind of start happening. Everybody respected it. And all the hippie bands that had been kind of playing country music decided, well, maybe this is okay, you know? Maybe there is an audience that crosses over between the long-haired weirdos and the, what do you call it without saying the redneck populace? <laughs> Except that we discovered those two groups had a lot more in common than they did have, you know, adverse to each other. There really was conscious thought of, of taking two diverse groups and proving to them by putting them together in the same room that they could not only have fun, but they did, in fact, have a whole lot of common. We could do a lot of different things. I think this is one moment in the world headquarters that's ready for Freddy. Never seen one, this is one. The Haight Ashbury was in ruins at the time. It looked like a bombed out war zone. And uh, visits back, I had realized that, yeah, these people are able to do this. And all kinds of great acts, you know, coming into the town that never used to come through Austin. The music venues were a kind of church back in the day, enlightening, uh, uplifting, and inspirational, even spiritual aspect to uh, the music that was being created. When Alvin Crow had everybody in Armadillo flailing around to his hottest country swing music, and Bruce Springsteen was getting ready to go on, had never been opened by a country act before, and he was pacing back and forth, real uneasy. And Mr. Threadgill looked down and didn't know who Bruce was. Nobody in Austin really did that moment. And he told Tiny, that young fella right there is nervous as an old hound trying to pass a peach pit. You know, and they, they dealt generally with a, a well-rendered pen and ink portrait or something with some sort of slightly rebellious lettering around it. <laughs> We were distinguishing ourselves from, from San Francisco. We also developed and utilized a lot of Texas iconography. The cowboy fantasy was what we needed to exploit and ride on. Texans had become very self-conscious about being Texans. 
they had lost their connection to the ground. We didn't like that very much. We were looking for much more honesty. People walked by the posters in San Francisco. It was a pedestrian city. You could walk by and you could study and contemplate a poster. To me, there's a lot of San Francisco art. It was artistically wonderful, but it wasn't very practical as far as uh, selling an event. The legibility thing with the San Francisco poster artist was really quite an issue. We had the producer Bill Graham, who was the more capitalist establishment kind. He really insisted on legibility. And it was a constant battle between him and his poster artist. Whereas Chet Helms over at the Avalon was a, a hippie zealot, and he encouraged his artists to do whatever they want. Guys like Rick Griffin put together posters that literally could not be read until you stared at them like a, an optical illusion. The lettering issue on the posters sort of mirrored the general shift from the 60s to the 70s. The artistic font was a the San Francisco phenomenon that I broke down into real simple terms. I said, I don't want to ever see a poster that I can't read. Do like Jim Franklin did on this Jerry Lee Lewis poster. You got to be able to read it driving 35 or 40 miles an hour with the wing vents open and a 44 ounce Diet Cherry Limeade held between your bare thighs because you got on South Austin cutoffs, which means one ball out. And Eddie, I mean, he was past the, the psychedelic period and he was trying to get a crowd that actually drank Lone Star beer. He saw the poster as an advertisement to people maybe who weren't part of the end thing. I wish I had booked some country stuff. You know, I, I never booked a, a country. Country psychedelic, it could have started a lot sooner. It didn't, it started, you know, that started in 73 with with Waylon Jennings and uh, Honky Donk Heroes. Waylon says, so you can still hear it on the microphone, that little red-headed motherfucker, I'm gonna kill him. What has he got me into as the big cloud of smoke began to roll up over the stage? He's complaining about uh, Willie bringing, uh, bringing him into the power bill? Yes, yes. He was so fucking upset. But then after that cloud began to be breathed increasingly by the band. Each one's signature ride became an entire album's worth of music. Ann Richards, you know, looked out from behind the curtain at 1,500 people smoking pot and asked me, how do you keep from getting busted? And I said, well, we don't feel like we're doing anything wrong, so it doesn't seem like we're drawing any heat. I wasn't drinking beer. What are you talking about? Just drinking beer. Jack Mark, it was numbers. The numbers crushed the police presence. We sold more Lone Star beer than anybody in the state of Texas. In the early days, you know, we literally were this real visible, little oily, you know, slightly hunched shouldered, you know, mass that sort of slithered around town, offending people, you know, everywhere you went. <laughs> It was more of a free spot than anywhere in Texas, comparatively, in what was a hostile environment. All the people from both coasts were so impressed that something this laid back and kick ass at the same time was out here in the middle of the stinking redneck nightmare that the bands all talked about it. I moved here with a band, you know, and I was just thinking I'd just be a musician. I wasn't really planning to be a poster artist or anything, but the band I was in said, 
we think you could make some of these posters, couldn't you? And I said, yeah, I guess. I assume I could, you know. And of course, I hadn't done a lot of work in pen and ink or anything. First couple I did with Michael Priest, because he was kind of showing me the ropes. We don't even want to depict. We want to suggest. Really well-placed suggestion is much more powerful than a precise depiction. Looks like it's overworked, or it looks so much like the reference that you can't tell the difference. Because like I said, I've never taken any art courses, so you know, I was really just a pencil or pen and ink, you know, basic media. And to my great wonder and amazement, Franklin was teaching guys like Danny the same things I was teaching, but he thought he was a fine artist. Not a commercial artist, oh no, never a commercial artist. I'm so, get so angry about commercial art, the commercialization of art. The Americans now think of art as just part of advertising. They don't know what fine art is because they, they don't see it. But he didn't understand that he was doing commercial art and he was doing a real good job and he was teaching it. I like the ones with the pinholes. Oh, in fact, we've tried and tried and tried to make the uh, collectors and the museum people understand that they were designed to be advertising. So if they have tape marks and pinholes in them, and people still have them, like that means they served their purpose and they've still been cared for and cherished and subsequently should be worth a lot more money. It's like a patina on a bronze statue. Exactly, precisely correct. There you go. This may have now, possibilities as an artistic show yet. And you can do a poster that's all arcane and fucked up that only the select few will get. In any one of those scenarios, that's a failure because you're only reaching a percentage of the audience. You want to reach a maximum audience because it's a, what is a rock poster? It's advertising, right? And advertising so that people will come to the show. Well, I was scared, of course. You know, I was always like when I when I did sort of a really weird poster like. First time I remember, it was, I did a Loudon Wainwright poster early on, and I put his face on his nose because that morning or something I'd had this dream where I saw some guy's face on his nose. And what? Okay, dream images. Okay, all that aside, that's still kind of weird. What if, uh, what if that was a message from the gods of sleep, from Morpheus? Or what? What? What did uh, he say about it? He liked it. This is a pretty hectic scene. Uh, I got ulcers uh, from this job because of the pressure involved. And we had gotten where, in order to make a living, we were just working around the clock. I was putting in a 40-hour week, but straight, between Sunday and Thursday, sleeping for eight hours, and then getting up and putting in another 40-hour week between Thursday and Sunday. We started with maybe two a month. By the time I left in 1976, we had six a week. Six touring acts. Six touring acts a week. You know, I hate to do this, but it's a shame. The poster had to be out before the friggin' dance took place, you know? And uh, it was a very intense situation, so you, the burnout factor was, was pretty heavy. You know, this is about five in the morning, we cried. Uh, on deadlines, so like, you know, just other, every bar stroke, but, uh, You got all this tension in your shoulders, and your head is all tense, and people thought we just knocked this stuff out, you know? Oh, I just, it just knocked it us oh. out. All right. The important thing to understand about poster art is, for any of these people that pursued it, that's a vow of poverty. You're not making any money. Well, it's, it's an incubator. I mean, well, that's the way I saw Austin. I mean, that's what I was looking for. Not exactly a place that was going to be a big time. We were all broke. I can remember, like, you know, start saving for the start of the month, be able to pay the rent at the end of the month, and then it was close call. You weren't making any money. You would make a little bit of money, and you'd get to get an armadillo free and see the shows. And I think, basically, 
That was one of the main attractions. We all drew merrily along through the springtime. They had begun to parody each other. Everybody thought that one of the other guys had gone this asleep at the wheel post. Well, it turns out it was none of us. It was a new guy, Sam Yates. And when they asked him about it, he just said, well, I just did it in the generic Austin style, which we might as well have been run over by a bulldozer. We were just horrified. And I'm still going to classes, and I got, you know, 7.30 life drawing class in North Texas, and everybody else wants to stay up all night and play music and get high. If you played in bands, you know it's this constant battle of egos. People quit. I mean, just about the time you start sounding good, somebody gets mad at somebody else and leaves. The bass player, who I'd known since high school, had moved to Austin. And I came down to visit him. It's cold and shitty up in, in Denton at wintertime. And I came down here, and it was sunny. The girls were out with their you know, with their tube tops, and I thought, holy shit, this is heaven. And they were playing in the, uh, in the garden at the Armadillo that night. So I had to go by and pick up D, or Guy Juke, who was also in the band. And we went over to his house, and he was working on a Jerry Garcia poster for the Armadillo. It was really amazing. And I think that was really one of the first introductions I ever had to Armadillo posters. I had done a few things like for like a local club, to feel like maybe you know an ad for a TV guide thing, you know. But I had never seen anything like the scope of what was going on down here. So there became a huge explosion of differences. Juke went into Cubist bebop. He could do like any style. He could do the realistic ink work. Next, you could do some kind of perfect little design out of three squares in a circle. Just like blow your mind. Like, how does he do this? Get the simplicity at the same time, it's very complex. Uh, Danny Garrett went into those beautiful old engraving techniques from the 1800s. And uh, I went back to kind of where I'd come from, which was cartoons. Ken Featherston worked at the Armadillo. His art is informed by the visuals of that extra dimension. Show me when he, he is a rock star of the bunch. I mean, he really is with his long flowing hair, surfer dude looks, and just his attitude, man. He's, he's just this upbeat cat. It was a, a Pointer Sisters show. It was after midnight. And a true redneck came and was acting like a jerk and was ousted. For being a drunk and, a, and harassing people by Henry Gonzalez. Both of them best friends from Corpus Christi. He went home in his pickup truck, got a rifle, came back, and in the parking lot, uh, Ken Featherston and another security guy were standing at the door. Ken Featherston had nothing to do with the previous incident or booting him out of the club, and the guy shot him. One of the nicest, sweetest people in, in the world. Hope I don't see you, see tomorrow, tomorrow. You will be my angel. The national level artist and had enormous potential, as did many of these people. His work was cut short, very short. I was standing at the station. And uh, everything changed. There was a small handful of people trying to make as much fun as they could with a few thousand friends traipsing through their living room every night. And we miss it. You get used to having a couple of thousand people in your living room. Yeah. And I didn't think that would be possible until it was gone.
Well, Franklin started it maybe with the armadillo, but he's gone within three years over to the Ritz. When Jim Franklin had the Ritz Theater on 6th Street. Oh, yeah. And it was magnificently wonderful because they had no money, but they had lots of hippies and lots of time. Now, as I understand it, this was the first performance of the group that was or would become the Iranian Savages. Well, Mr. Franklin right here started the Ritz Theater in 1974. abandoned porno theater on 6th Street, <laughs> and Jim saw the potential. <laughs> we said, can we play here one night? And he goes, well, okay, we'll give you a Thursday. That's not what's happening. <laughs> we were the Uranium Savages, and there was also another band called the Marshmark. So we were going to do a battle of the bands. And, uh, we had a bartender on stage. We had like 15 electric guitars. We just did everything we possibly could to actually have a show. And we did win the Battle of the Bands. And the reason how we won, because the Marshmongers were a real band. They were cheers. We were liars. We were on drugs. We didn't know better. <laughs> kind of our claim to fame that particular night was the Marshmongers' bass player was Clifford Anton. And he lost and went on to open up Antones. <laughs> on New Year's Eve, we did so well, so Creek Saloon hired us, and the rest is history. You always know it's Carrie's part. It's damn important. I mean, if you see it, you never confuse his work with anybody else. That's that's really a, that's really a compliment. The thing about a lot of Austin artists is uh, we enjoyed the work and we stayed here and did it, and uh, we weren't really thinking commercial. These guys did a lot of work. We did a lot of work. You got to drag me away, you know. <laughs>
so much of what happened back then is that space to exist could be vast but inexpensive. The true secret behind Austin is that this confluence of historical and socioeconomic things created a real fertile place for a short period of time. Now it's gone. It's too expensive. All the affordable, acceptable workspaces are disappearing under the bulldozer blade. This is the law of unintended consequences. This is now a very popular place to come. Austin, beginning of new Austin. I heard that. Welcome to Austin. Too bad you missed it. When you've got the world's live music capital, but the, uh, but the musician can't afford the rent. You won't see a place like this in operation no way. It'll all be big, high fruit places where no one can get in but the rich people. If there's an Austin character, it's a, it's a character that's been changed a lot and been imported by people from the outside. You know, people have been asking me about the changes of Austin for the last 40 years. I enjoy observing things, and it's very interesting to observe things that are changing before your eyes. Watching cities grow, huge buildings in six months, I mean, that's, that's fascinating and people all over the world are into it. Convince them, hey, you like our culture? Well, before you rent it all out of town, you might want to, you know, Austinize your apartment, your condo, the parking place. They all said to, almost to a person, well, I'm gonna go out there and make enough money so I can afford to move back to Austin and retire here. So their ultimate goal was actually to go make a lot of money somewhere else and move back to Texas so they could retire. And I thought, well, just let's just cut out that middle part and just retire now. That's what I did. And now I'm still here. Now they come back. And some of them have money and some of them don't. But a lot of them are coming back ultimately. Well, I got to go home. Come home now. You better have money because you can't come back expecting to be 1975 rent anymore. There's all kinds of pluses, all kinds of minuses. So you can grumble about them, then you're not affecting it. You may as well groove on the change, you know, groove on it. Like Doug Tom would say, it's Groover's Paradise. Eventually, they, once you've, you've covered the entire environment, with, with imagery, sooner or later someone notices it, you know. Surprisingly, people all over the world know where Austin is. <laughs> and that still just blows my mind. I wish we could get in free at the South by Southwest, because I believe we earned it, but that's a different matter for a whole different movie. So thank you very much for having me, and uh, thank you very much for putting up with me. And uh, y'all take care of each other, and uh, hopefully I'll see you on the dance floor. All right, now. Bye. There you go. Slick down the hair. All right, all right. How's that look? I think that looks pretty, pretty good. Damn, do it. Like Thank you, Art.
underfoot. No rusty nails, no definite need for belief. But I'm satisfied. So satisfied. Yeah. But I'm satisfied. Yes, I'm so I feel fat with goods. 